Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having the time today to join us for the students. And definitely, thank you so much for Chris. Uh, we are like really happy to have you today here. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to Spilling the Tea sessions for today. Uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Chris Foucault. Uh, she is an uh, Erlem graduate of uh, 1970. Uh, just uh, spilling the tea sessions, just a little bit of background. This is like sessions where we meet uh, Erlem alumni to talk to them and know, like get to know them more and get like a space for them to share their experiences with us so that we can learn from them. Uh, this session specifically is hosted by the CGCE and the CGH. And uh, if you have any questions, if you want any of our career coaches to actually meet with you and support you through our if your your career of interest, feel free to reach us to us and like book appointments with the, with the different career coaches via Handshake. Uh, this session is going to be recorded. And uh, if you want to rewatch this session or, or share it with a friend uh, that who could not me make it to this session, please feel free to visit the CGCE website. And the session is going to be there after this meeting. And yeah, I think we're going to get started. A little bit about myself. My name is Ahmed Deeb. I am a sophomore from uh, Palestine. I I'm uh, majoring in biochemistry and minoring in psychology and public health. And I'm going to be in, like, I'm interested in becoming a surgeon after Arlam. Uh, today, our host, uh, like our guest is uh, uh, Chris. Chris, I would like to give you the floor to introduce yourself a little bit, to give us a little bit more information about when did you join Arlam? What did you major in Arlam? And a little bit about your experience here at Arlam. Okay. So um, I joined Earlham in 1966 and this was really in the middle of the Vietnam War to place it in history and it Earlham was really the perfect place to be at that time. I was there when there were the famous Kent uh, State University shootings um, and but everything at Earlham was very peaceful because of its Quaker background and um, nonviolence being a deeply rooted part of the campus. So it was a very good place to be going to school during that period. There were no, in Berkeley, uh, police were tear gassing students, students were protesting in the street, um, but you could study and have a really nice college experience at Earlham. I was a chemistry major. I don't think they had biochemistry as a major then. You could be chemistry or biology or physics. And um, I was a chemistry major um, and I went to uh, medical school at the University of California, San Francisco. I was very fortunate as a non-California resident uh, to be admitted. And I was also fortunate in those days that it's since changed that after the first year, I just had to get a California driver's license um, and um, vote and I was able to become a resident and pay resident tuition, which at that time was about a thousand dollars a year, which is unbelievable. But I will remind you at that time, you could also buy a brand new um, Nissan car for $3,000. <laughs> so uh, clearly the uh, economics were, were different. So I ended up staying at UC for 10 years. I did medical school for four years uh, internal medicine residency for three years. I was a chief resident at San Francisco General, which was my favorite hospital. It was a county hospital. Um, I then did two years of a pulmonary fellowship. Now that pulmonary critical care has expanded, so it's become much longer, ridiculously longer. But at that time, it was just uh, two years. After that, I came home to Hawaii and started working for Kaiser. I don't know if you're familiar with Kaiser. Kaiser is a health maintenance organization. It is one of the first, if not the first, um, health maintenance organization where the purpose is not to treat illness. So in the private practice system, you get paid for people being sick and, tr and then you treat them. Whereas in the HMO, you get paid period for the patient and it's your job to keep them well. Otherwise you'll go bankrupt. So uh, this was, it was a, started by Henry Kaiser, who 
just briefly was an incredible industrialist at the height. He had Kaiser steel, Kaiser um, cement. He had a large shipyard in Oakland, which during World War II produced one ship a day for the U United States, which is phenomenal. But he said, and it's true, that his lasting legacy would be his health care. And um, I think it is. It's prim primarily on the West Coast. But um, I retired from Kaiser after 30 years. I had a fabulous um, career doing pulmonary and critical care uh, medicine. I still work. I work at a military hospital now part time. Um, I've been there now 10 years, which I can't believe. <laughs> and uh, now I just do sleep medicine, which is a very um, nice retirement job. There's uh, very little night call, no weekends, um, as opposed to pulmonary, which is quite different with all the critical care work. So um, that's, that's basically um, my background. Well, thank you so much. That's, that's actually really interesting to kind of see how you get involved into a different field within the same uh, medical uh, area. I was uh, like, I wanted to ask you, how, how did you get involved into these fields? How did you decide to get involved into the sleep medicine after you did everything? Well, you know, I think, yes, you're, I think you're influenced very much by the, uh, where you go to medical school and who the mentors are and who are the great physicians. And when I was at UC, the pulmonary department was incredibly strong. I mean, the, the major still, the major pulmonary textbook um, is by two men, one of whom is dead, but um, by two men who were pulmonologists at UC. So the department was very strong. And uh, many um, graduates, particularly graduates of myself who were chief residents went into pulmonary disease. When I, when I look back at uh, several chief residents before me, I mean, there were a disproportionate number of pulmonologists. So I think you get influenced um, by that. Um, I, after I finished my training, which the state of California provided, and uh, I cost them a lot of money, I moved back to Hawaii. So they didn't benefit at all from all the money they spent training me because I immediately left as soon as I uh, finished. And I, I was interested. I had been a Kaiser member all my life, and I was interested interested in that form of medical care. Um, I didn't, at that time, many people went into medicine because of the money. And doctors made uh, an incredible amount of money then. Uh, that's no longer true, I think. I mean, relatively. I mean, doctors, I think you can always be assured that you can get a job. So that's not a problem. There's always a need for physicians. But um, I don't think you necessarily will get the same kind of relatively high compensation as they did then. But I wasn't interested in that. And so I went, my whole life I've been salaried. I've never um, done fee-for-service medicine. So um, it gives me the freedom to do what I think is needed and necessary for the patient, but not... Um, excessively test. On the other hand, you do a lot of preventative things to prevent th people from getting uh, sick. So, you know, smoking cessation becomes very big. Um, in Hawaii, our smoking rate is very low, but uh, outside of a system like Kaiser, you don't get compensated for getting your patient to quit smoking, you know, um, and for promoting health. So uh, I've been a, a strong believer in that that kind of medicine. And now I'm in a different kind of medicine, which is also very interesting. The military is very different, very different. I see, I mostly see active duty, young, healthy uh, soldiers who have deployed often a lot. Um, and that's a whole, they have a whole different set of problems. Yeah, that's really interesting that you mentioned that the military system is different. Uh, coming from a different background, uh, we do not have a military back home. And it's it's really interesting. It's like 
actually the first time I know here that that system of the military, the healthcare system of the military is very different from the normal healthcare system. Could you maybe touch a little bit on that and to some like similarities and differences between them? Yeah, so the, the military system um, is in, in one sense like Kaiser, I mean, uh, all military families have incredible coverage. Their, their military care, medications, et cetera, are all free. Um, in, in return, however, they have to do military service. And um, I have seen the results of, you know, what happens when patients have multiple deployments and um, have to do jobs that um, are not very good. Like I had a guy who was a mortuary officer, you know, things like that. And um, so I see many patients who have developed PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, which is associated with sleep problems, um, including sleep apnea, as well as insomnia. Um, and so you, you see the, the results of that. So what's good is that I can order any medication, any test, and I know that the patient will be able to afford it and will get it done. And um, I think the quality of the military doctors in general is very good. Um, I was uh, very happy to see my former chief actually when Trump had uh, COVID and they were doing the um, briefings and it, it, with his personal physician who was not terribly smart or, or suited to, he was a radiologist, not suited really for that job. Um, but my former chief was standing uh, right, right in the back. He's the head at Walter Reed now. He's the head of pulmonary at Walter Reed and a, a great guy. Um, so that's, that's the, the good part of it. You know, you, I know that I can practice medicine the way I want to. I am salaried. I don't have to worry about, you know, how many patients I see that I'm going to make more or less money and uh, that sort of thing. Yep, that, that's, that's really interesting for me personally to know, because especially the systems between countries different. Now, shifting the topic a little bit more about Erlem, the one thing that we all have in common here, like one of the things actually. Uh, so I wanted like, I want you to kind of talk a little bit more about your Erlem experience and how it impacted your way into going into health care and into the health medicine. Okay, so um, I went to Erlem having never visited the school, having, there was no virtual tours. All I had was this little booklet that I read about Earlham. Um, I applied early admission, I was accepted. And so I really didn't apply to any other schools. So I came, I came to Earlham um, having never been anywhere. The furthest I'd ever been was I'd been to California, I think twice maybe. I had never, I'd never been any further than that. So it was the furthest east I had gone. Um, I, as you know, at least then, probably still now, the closest airport was Dayton, Ohio. So I flew into Dayton, which is quite a distance away, 40 miles away, and was picked up when you freshmen come early, right? So the only people that are there are the athletes, right, that are there early too. So I got picked up by the captain of the soccer team. And... Uh, stayed at um in the dorm that first year you of course you you don't get to choose who you live with so i lived with a um woman who had spent was a quaker from maine who had spent the previous year at a boarding school in england so that was very interesting she was very into things i'd never heard of like marmite and she had tea hot tea every day and um <laughs> So that was a, a, and she wanted the room very cold because in England they had no central heat and, and I was not used to the cold because I came from Hawaii. So, and it turned out that those women, then the dorms were quite segregated, male and female. And we had hours, we had to be in 
the dorm by 10, I think, as I recall. And um, there was one telephone, one telephone on the whole hall that everybody shared. Um, so it turns out that the women that I roomed with throughout the rest of my Earlham uh, career were there that in the hall were the women that I was with on that at, at Earlham Hall that first year. So um, I roomed with, um, unfortunately, two of my roommates have already uh, died. My first year roommate died of ALS in her 30s. My second year roommate who was from Kansas um, died in her 50s of a lymphoma. She was an extremely talented musician, played vi violin, viola, piano, organ. Um, and then my third year, my junior year roommate, I'm still continue to be very close to. Um, she was a biology major, became the head of uh, the polar regions, research in the polar regions for the National Science Foundation, quite prominent in, um, in that governmental uh, job. She just recently retired, but she represented the US in the Antarctic Treaty negotiations every year in Tasmania. She'd gone that, to that for years and she visited Antarctica every year as part of her job. So um, Polly, her sister actually um, was at Earlham as a librarian, Sarah Penhale. I don't. So Sarah Penhale was her sister that's just a year younger a year behind us. So I know Sarah very well too. So Polly became quite a distinguished, um, had quite a distinguished career. Um, so I've, I've, and then my senior year, I was a roommate. My roommate was from Japan who had gone, her father was a pretty prominent scientist and she had gone to school in Bar Harbor, Maine and had then um, gone to Earlham after that. And she was from Kyoto, and um, I think Jap you know the whole Japanese influence is still strong at Earlham in terms of language and foreign study and um, things like that. So uh, she now lives in Canada, and so I think you know just starting with with that group, I have continued to be close to them after. Uh, leaving Earlham and um, I was not I, I must say I wasn't very active in any too many things at Earlham other than school I, I'm not athletic I didn't play any sports um, I did not um, play in any orchestras or things like that um, so I'm trying to think, I think other, I had a pretty boring life. I think I was there just studying. <laughs> um, I did, I did get to, I did get to travel a little bit. I had a high school classmate at Antioch, of course, a very different school, school, especially then. And so I went to, I went to, visit um i went to visit antioch during one period when i was at earlham yeah that's that's actually really interesting to hear about earlham before and how it's now and i'm like kind of comparing the different uh like what has been changed i wanted to ask how did uh earlham shape your decision of actually going uh to mid school afterwards uh what what type of support did you receive from Erlem? Uh, was there specific stuff that you recommend for students who are applying currently for mid for mid schools to actually put into considerations too? So, I um, went to Erlem. I knew I was interested in science. Um, I, I became a chemistry major, and then um, when I was in about my sophomore year, it was the first time I ever thought about medicine because. I thought, well, I have this chemistry degree. Um, I knew that a huge majority of Earlham graduates went on to some kind of post 
college education. So I thought, well, I could go get a PhD. Some of my close friends actually um, went on and got PhDs, including Polly, um, and in, including Carol, who was the one who got me through calculus and who uh, became a chemist at Dow. Um, so I thought, well, I could either be, get a PhD and be in a lab, but I really liked people and I'm quite social. And so I decided maybe I'll be a doctor because then I'll get to work with people. And I told my father that I, I wanted to go to medicine. And he said, oh, I don't think so. I don't know that you can handle it. Um, so he got me a job in the emergency room at a major trauma center here. He said, well, after you do that, if you still want to go into medicine, then it's okay. So I was just like an observer. I mean, I didn't do anything. I just was a gopher type of person in the ER. And I, um, I decided, yes, I still wanted to go into medicine. Uh, and so it was, it was kind of a choice. I, I sort of viewed that I had to go to some kind of, since everybody else at Earlham went to graduate school, I had to go to some kind of graduate school too. And uh, between getting a PhD versus going to medicine, I decided to go into medicine. Yeah, that, that is really interesting, like touching about the shadowing experiences and the different, uh, like getting hands-on experience from the very beginning to, to see if you actually fit into that. Uh, now I just would like to open the floor for the students who join us today. If you have any questions that they want to specifically ask, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions. If you want me to ask the questions, also feel free to type it also in the chat and I will like uh, ask it for Christine. No questions. I see there are a lot of women, which is very encouraging because um, at the time that I went to medical school, there weren't. So my class at UC was relatively large for medical school. We had about 150 students of which there were 20 women. And they said that, well, that was because that was in proportion to the number of women who applied. But in fact, the year after mine, the number of women doubled. And now at UC, there are more women than men. Um, so I, I think that's uh, one thing that the, the gender uh, change has been tremendous in medicine. Um, this, the second thing, particularly for women, I think is that, I, th I think it may be less true now, but when I trained, um, most women, even if they were married, had no children. So, and you didn't have children while you were training. It was like basically un, pretty much a very unusual occurrence. So, um, but, but fortunately the birth control pill was invented while I was in college. <laughs> uh, so, um, as a result of that, most women in my generation did not have children. I didn't finish my training and I didn't have a first, my first job till I was 32 or 33 years old. And so most women um, delayed having children for a very, very long time, which has its own um, problems. And I, I know many women colleagues of mine uh, who have had uh, difficulty having children because they were older and because fertility goes down as you get older. I do personally have, oh, go Sarah. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Sarah. I'm currently a junior here at Earlham. And I saw in the little bio we received about you that you are an assistant clinical professor at the University of Hawaii. And I wanted you to speak a little about maybe your um, experience with that in uh, teaching at a medical school and um, maybe if you've done any sort of research in your life, maybe speak a little about that as well. So the only research I've really done was when I was at UC 
Um, and so being a clinical professor, I mostly, I did an occasional lecture here and there, but mostly since I, my main job was taking care of patients, um, I had uh, interns and residents ro doing rotations with me. So, um, and I still do at, at Tripler. I have um, residents do rotations with me. So they um, come when I was at, at Kaiser and learn about pulmonary and critical care medicine and see patients and do consults and uh, things like that. So it didn't really involve a lot of research. Um, right now in most universities, not so much in Hawaii. Hawaii has a problem because we do not have a university hospital, but for example, in a big tertiary medical facility like UC, um, if, if you're on faculty until recently, um, research was a huge part of your job. And if you, you had to be successful in doing research. Now they, they also have another educational track where you can be uh, a university professor, but your specialty is education, meaning you, your job is educating medical students, educating uh, trainees, residents, and fellows. So there is now uh, at, le at least a switch. It used to be that you had to um, be a very productive research person, which uh, now particularly is very competitive and very difficult. Are you thinking about where you'd like to um, apply to go to medicine? Yeah, um, I currently have an interest in uh, maybe applying for the health professions uh, scholarship program through the Navy. And so since I saw that you worked at a Tripler um, and things like that, I was interested in perhaps uh, University of Hawaii for medicine as one of the places to apply. So if you have any kind of advice for that or um, just thoughts about yeah. the school. Yeah, medicine. so I think, I think that's an incredible program to um, my cousin actually and her husband um, attended Ushus, you know, the, the military medical school in Washington, DC. I don't know if you know about that, but they attended uh, Ushus. My cousin became a rheumatologist. Her husband became a gastroenterologist after they um, finished their uh, service, they went into private practice in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, but that, I know a lot of physicians at Tripler who have gone th through that program. And I, th I think it's, a, it's incredible because it pays you and supports you. You can go to any medical school. You can go to the military medical school, which is very good, um, or, um, you can, you know, pick another medical school of your choice and um, be paid. I think she got paid basically as a low level officer, like, I don't know, a lieutenant or something like that while she was um, in training, but um, they shipped her car and 5,000 pounds of belongings from Hawaii to Washington, DC. Um, she had free meal, so I mean, she never ever cooked because you might as well just eat at the what we call the DFAC, the dining facility. Um, and I think it's a really excellent program. I think you know the education and training that you get is very is very good. Um, is there a reason you want to come to Hawaii besides that it's a wonderful place to live? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was looking a little into, um, right now, one of my interests is pathology and yeah. looking into the pathology department. And I also work in a pharmacy. So like uh, tropical medicine and pharmacology are some of my top interests, which I thought uh, the programs at the University of Hawaii looked really interesting. Yeah, they have us, um, they have problem-based learning at the University of Hawaii. So it's a little, it's a little bit different way of uh, learning at, in uh, medical school. Like when I was in medical school, it was still like you went to first two years, you went to lectures and whatever. And it wasn't until the second two years that you got any clinical experience with problem-based learning. It's learning based around a 
the patient case. So they present a patient and you learn the medicine through the patient problems. So maybe the patient has heart disease, maybe the patient has liver disease, whatever. And, you, and that's how you uh, learn medicine. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit different. Um, tropical medicine is, I don't know how strong tropical medicine is, but I know we, uh, one of my colleagues when I was at Kaiser had gone to the most famous London School of Tropical Diseases. And I had wondered why they put this fellow in a, who was this very proper British guy with this cute little British accent. And they put him out in a very native Hawaiian rural area of the island. Um, and um, it was because I, I think they initially put him there because of his background in, in uh, tropical diseases. And, um, but you, you can see lots of weird tropical diseases wherever you, you train. Um, I, I saw a case of leprosy when I was at UC and he was quite a puzzle. He had a particular kind of leprosy when he came in and we, were, we knew he had some um, infectious disease, but we weren't sure. We isolated him and then his family came in and said, oh, him, he has leprosy. And so then it all became clear um, what he had. So I think if you go to any major medical institution, you know, you will, you will probably be able to um, learn a lot about um, tropical diseases. And wh where are you, um, wh where's your home state? Um, I'm from here in Indiana. Okay. So you have a very fine medical school in, at IU. Um, I, I'll tell you, I applied obviously to multiple medical schools. Now, not a ridiculous number, but um, I, and I applied for the University of Hawaii, which at that time was not even a four-year school. It was a two-year school and then you transferred um, as my backup because I think your chances are best in your home state you know, as a, as a resident. Um, and I was accepted at every school except the University of Chicago, which of course is a, a very good um, medical school, very competitive. Um, but I think, you know, I was a little concerned coming from Earlham, but I was accepted at Washington University, for example, in St. Louis, which is also very excellent. Um, medical school, um, obviously at UC, um, and I'm trying to remember where else I applied. I don't know if I, I don't think I applied to University of Washington, but I applied to, um, I applied to Stanford too, Stanford and UC, yeah. But I think, it, you know, you need sort of a backup school, which is usually your home state, your home state um, school. And I think pathology is great. You know, I loved pathology at UC. It was, an, and histology, it was unbelievable. We each had got a microscope when we, as a first year medical student, and you got a box of slides. And this box of slides were every single organ. And the slides were incredible. And it was because unfortunately, the specimens had come from prisoners who'd been executed. So they knew exactly when they were gonna die and were able to then take the organs and preserve them right away. So, but we had, and we also had a bone box. So you got a box with a complete skeleton. <laughs> I don't know if they do that anymore, but got a box with a complete skeleton in it to learn about the bones. And then you had a microscope with all these slides to, to learn about the different organs. And of course, then you, had anatomic pathology. And I'd had very little biology at Earlham, um, just the minimum to, that was required for medical school. So um, I know the University of Hawaii still has uh, an anatomic pathology course. Um, and uh, that, was, that was also, um, but I, anyway, I, I loved pathology. I think pathology is, um, is incredibly interesting field. In fact, I was just reading this morning an article about COVID pathology, pathology in patients who died of COVID. And, um, and 
that reveals a lot of um, interesting things. I mean, it turns out now that clotting is a, is a huge factor, uh, blood clotting, in situ clotting in the lung. Um, and then I, I read that there was a, a young woman in college in Indiana that just died from COVID at a small um, Bible college, Grace College or something like that. And she got sick, had been diagnosed with COVID, um, was getting better, was self-isolating in her dorm room and was found dead. And um, I, she died of a pulmonary embolism, a, a clot in her lung. And so um, I, I think you learn a lot from pathology and autopsies and things like that. And um, we, we don't do as many autopsies now as used to be done. And I think there still is a lot to learn even when you think you know why people have died. Sometimes there are uh, surprises, you know, when um, you actually do an autopsy. So pathology, I think is a great, it's really a great field. Any other questions? Um, I do personally have a question. Um, from your transitioning from Erlem to the mid-school, what are like some of the challenges that you actually have faced uh, during that transition or stuff that you wish that you have known about mid-school before actually going there? Um, I actually didn't think the transition was that bad. Um, I got married immediately after college. In those days, women either got married or they went to school and I did both. I got married and then went to, went to school too. Um, so I was most concerned about, like I mentioned um, to Ahmed um, er earlier about whether Earlham had properly prepared me, and Earlham certainly did. Um, did I tell my story about Princeton? I did. To be no, I didn't. So when I um, went to medical school, there were about four people, other people from Hawaii, but um, one of the other people um, had gone to an elite private school here, Punahou, which is where Barack Obama went to school. And then he had gone to Princeton and I thought, oh my gosh, I mean, these are the people that I'm gonna be um, in uh, school with, competing with for my training programs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this pyramid system is especially true in surgery. I know as you're interested in surgery, um, it's still, I think the pyramid system still exists. So in other words, you start out with this group of interns and as you go higher and higher and higher up, it's one person at the top in the hospital. So um, in, in medicine, it's not like that. You start as an intern, you will finish your residency or whatever training you're doing and become that kind of doctor. But in surgery, a lot of the people that start out and want to be surgeons, some of them actually don't want to be general surgeons or regular surgeons, they may be want to become a urologist or an ophthalmologist or you know something else so you start out with this big group and then it slowly gets winnowed down so it's quite competitive it's very competitive um, uh, in, in surgical training programs now i forgot your question what was your question again maybe i didn't answer it I think you already addressed the question about like the challenges uh, of like transitioning from Ireland to the mid school. Um, does any other student have any specific question that they want to mention? Any other questions?
I think um, when I started medicine, I actually didn't know what kind of doctor I wanted to become. I mean, some people do, some people, but um, I didn't even know I wanted to become a doctor until, like I said, I was a sophomore at Earlham, and then I went to medical school, and I didn't really know what kind of medicine I wanted to do till I was probably at the end of my, um, actually in the middle of my residency program in internal medicine. Um, so I think along the way you, you can figure out what uh, is, is the best field for you. I think now a lot of the students are influenced by lifestyle and by how much money they're gonna make. Uh, in those days, uh, they weren't, we, I think we we're more interested by what we were interested in, who our mentors were, because uh, really uh, pulmonary and critical care is like incredibly busy. Um, lots of, um, even in the job I had, but even more so in private practice, a lot of night call being called back into the hospital um, and, and things like that. Whereas um, certain subspecialties now like ophthalmology, orthopedics have become incredibly competitive um, because of either the amount of money you can make or the lifestyle that you can live. So um, when I was training, I have a friend who said um, to get into orthopedics, uh, you had to be in the bottom 25% of your class. Now you have to be in the top 10% if you want to become an orthopedic surgeon because it is so competitive. Um, and I think the same is probably true of ophthalmology or dermatology. Um, they're very, very popular um, specialties. Um, yeah, thank you. I don't know if anyone have any other question that they want to ask. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I would I would say that uh, it was like really nice meeting you uh, today. Thank you so much for being here. It's definitely have like I've learned a lot from today, especially oh, about the military medicine and like your experience is like really interesting to see how Erlem helped you to actually go to med school and how your journey kind of gets shaped over the way. Um, on behalf of uh, CGCE and CGCE, like I thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for the students uh, who joined us today. As a reminder, if you want to re-watch this or actually a friend of you who didn't watch that, uh, just feel free to go to the CGCE website to see the recording of this uh, Zoom meeting. And if you need help with any uh, thing related to middle school or uh, uh, you need like some advice in your career after Erlem or even at Erlem, just feel free to reach out to our career coaches and book an appointment with them uh, through Handshake. Yes, yeah, so I would, I wanted to say particularly to Sarah, since she um, was interested in the military. Um, if you have any questions or anyone really, I'll give you my personal email address. So you can uh, email me at any time. So it's Chris Fukui, so it's C H R I S F as in Frank U K U I M D at gmail.com. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, because it's yeah, especially since you are interested in the military, which I think is 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 great. I think that whole program is is really very good. And the military produces great doctors and you get to travel all over and um, I even now, uh, because Tripler is basically the hospital for half the world, um, for the entire Pacific uh, Basin. So I see patients and consults from all over Asia, from, from places I've never even heard of. I mean, you know, um, so it, it's very interesting. <laughs>